week's episode of Mobile Suit Gundam Iron-Blooded Orphans was an absolute bloodbath. They're giving out bloody cockpits like they're freaking candy. If this were an Oprah Winfrey event, she'd be like, You get a bloody cockpit! You get a bloody cockpit! So many awesome mobile suit battles going on in this week's episode. Mikazuki vs. Julieta, Gailio vs. Megillus Fareed, even Isarugi getting involved in the battle. As it's also very clear this week's episode is sort of the calm before the big shitstorm that is going to be the finale of the series, which honestly, I have no idea how it's going to end. There are a couple of different factions at play here, and I'm still waiting for that moment where Megillus Fareed is going to basically just throw Tekadan to the wolves. That being said, this was an incredibly exciting episode. It opened up with basically just a lot of really cool kick-ass mobile suit battles going on. Mikazuki versus Julieta, which ended in a pretty predictable fashion, I do have to say. Julieta, of course, was bested, but I'm really surprised that Mikazuki didn't just finish her off. I mean, he's so much more ruthless when he's going up against other opponents, and for the most part, just completely decimates them until they explode. Here, basically, he just attacks her cockpit, and I was convinced that she was going to die, just like Shino in the last episode, but no, he kind of leaves her for dead. And then we go over to the Gundam Bile going up against the frickin' Gundam Camaris. And I have to admit, I'm not really all that impressed by Gundam Bale anymore. And the only reason I say that is because it hasn't really displayed anything too unique about itself, aside from the fact that it might contain the soul of the founder of Gallarhorn. Yes, it does have some cool golden swords, but when compared to Camaris, which has all of these kick-ass drills all over its body, I don't know, it just sort of pales in comparison. Either that, or maybe McGillis is just really holding back in this battle. That doesn't make their mobile suit fight any less intense, but I just want to see a little bit more from the Gundam Bale. And predictably, of course, Isarugi decides to jump in front of one of Gailio's attacks and ends up getting destroyed. He actually does get killed in this week's episode, because in the grand tradition of Gundam, when you have a mobile suit battle, you have to discuss philosophy while you do it. And that's what Gailio and Isarugi does, with Isarugi basically claiming that it doesn't matter if he dies, as long as he was a stepping stone towards Gallarhorn being better, if he could act as a shield for Megillus Fareed, it really is no skin off of his back. The rest of the episode, however, is basically just watching the characters, in particular the crew of Tekkenan, sort of like pick themselves up off the floor because they're still sort of grieving over the death of all of their lost friends in particular Shino, which has seemed to have affected a lot of people in different ways. I think one of the strongest elements of this episode is getting to see the reaction from Yamagi, actually admitting that he was in love with Shino, and that he would have much rather died with him than actually live alone without him, but at least according to him, Shino wouldn't approve of that at all. Yamagi even gets so upset that he actually ends up calling out Orga by saying that he's being cowardly by looking at all of the dead crew members of Tekadan while not trying to put up some sort of strong front. Really, he's just speaking from the heart and just filled with a lot of emotion here. And honestly, it's a heartbreaking scene when Eugene actually tells him the scene about Shino saying that he basically loves everyone on Tekadan for being just their individual selves, for being a very group of people, and even genuinely caring about them like a family. It's a really sad moment, and they could have made this really, really cheesy, but honestly, it was a really heartfelt scene, and honestly, I really do feel for Yamagi a lot. I will say, though, that this is definitely going to turn him into a much stronger character, and there's the possibility that we'll get to see him in battle in uh, probably the next couple of episodes. Either that, or he's just going to continue to be the support of the team. Either way, again, it demonstrates that even the side characters of Iron-Blooded Orphans are just as interesting as the main ones. Case in point, Orga and Mikazuki, who, again, reassure themselves of their partnership that they've had ever since that they were children, that basically Mikazuki is there to go all out whenever Orga decides to give that order. It's really freaking hardcore. I love it. Now, there's also some political intrigue going on in this episode as well. Rustall, of course, is always coming up with some brand new plans, and by the end of the episode, you get to learn that apparently Megillus Fareed is being relieved of his duties as a Brigadier General. I don't know how they're able to pull this off, considering he has the power of Gundam Bale, which supposedly is supposed to give him dominion over Gallarhorn, but then again, they haven't really gotten into the politics of how Gallarhorn really works. I mean, you have to remember, we are seeing two different factions of the group going to war with one another. Again, though, this just shows how shrewd Rustal Elion is as a tactician and how he's basically willing to go right for the balls. He's a real evil guy in many senses. But again, I don't trust McGillis either. I, I still think that he is up to something and has some sort of weird ulterior motive. That's why he's just allowing all of these pawns to die for him and basically play with them like his very own personal action figures. 
Hell, Gylio's actually brought that up multiple times in this series, although he still does manage to have something of a good heart as well. The scene where he's about to be plowed by the Kamaris' drill and he's reminded of the scene where he protected Almeria was a pretty hard-hitting scene. There were a lot of those like that in this episode. But ultimately, though, this was basically more of a build-up for the real big finale and everybody just grieving over the death of Shino, but we still got some really intense mobile suit battles. Julieta is somehow alive. She's danced with the devil in the pale moonlight, and she's even convinced herself that maybe she needs to get the Alaya Vinyana system implanted into her to become more than a human, to become something that can actually go up against Mikazuki. It's freaking great stuff. So, what's the rundown on this week's episode of Mobile Suit Gundam Iron-Blooded Orphans? The first half of the episode was just pure raw mobile suit action, and it did not disappoint. I've said it many times in my previous reviews, but I absolutely love the impact of mobile suits in this series. A lot of the times in the older Mobile Suit Gundam anime series, they almost seem a little frail, especially when they're using, like, beam weaponry. Here, everything is really blunt. Every single time these mobile suits ram into each other, you feel it, you hear it, and you can just imagine what it's probably feeling like when you're inside one of these incredibly powerful mobile suits. It, it just adds a little something different to this series, and it gives it a little something to make it more distinctive from the other Gundam series that I've seen before. I also continue to just love the absolute designs of some of these things. Like I said, Bale, while not the most impressive in terms of its abilities, Still looks sexy as hell. I absolutely love the design of that. Kamaris also manages to look incredibly awesome as well. I love the fact that it has drills all over its body, especially the ones in the knees. They're incredibly destructive and they're clearly designed to go right for the cockpit, which I think is also just really fucked up when you think about it. There's a scientist that designed a drill that was meant to go into a cockpit and basically turn someone into mincemeat, and that's pretty messed up when you think about it. Uh, really, though, like I said, though, this is just a glorified build-up to the finale, but it was still really entertaining nonetheless, and I think all of the scenes with Yamagi really hit at home. I really liked that, because it didn't feel forced, and it didn't feel like it was trying to pander to anything, um, and that's what I really appreciate, uh, appreciated about it a lot. I'm also really glad that I'm not the only one who's dense about that. I'm sort of like that along that with Shino. I never really, like, read into it too much in the previous episodes that Yamagi might have actually been in love with Shino. It's just something I tried not to pay attention to, and I honestly just saw them more as, like, a family, like they were brothers. But the evidence is clearly there now. Yamagi clearly is in love with him, and he had strong feelings for him. And uh, a lot of you guys definitely reminded me of that in the comments from last week's review, but I, I, I take it in all stride. I thought it was really funny. Um, what was not funny was this episode. There was no levity at all. There were no moments of peace. There were no moments that, you know, allowed you to relax. It's just letting you know shit's about to get real, characters are about to die, and there's no telling what's going to happen. There's always twists around every single corner. And is Eok ever going to get out in the freaking battlefield? Is anybody else waiting for that freaking dread-headed bastard to get killed? I hate that guy. I'm ready for him to jump back into his mobile suit, but for the most part, he's just sort of hanging around Rustal with his freaking tail in between his legs. It's honestly kind of annoying. I'm still waiting for his comeuppance. Whether it be in a mobile suit or him actually in that big spaceship, I, I just want to see that fucker explode. I'm just ready for that shit. So, this was a great episode right here of Iron-Blooded Orphans. A great build-up to the finale of the series, which had some awesome mobile suit action at the beginning of the episode. It's almost certainly going to end in tragedy, but I can't wait to see if there's going to be some twists for the rest of the series. Also, that scene at the end where Orga is giving that speech about basically allowing all of the soldiers of Tekkenan to realize his dream and standing strong for them, when they show that shot of Biscuit's hat... That hit me right here, man. It again reminds me of how attached I've actually become to these characters. More so than a lot of the other random crew members that you see in a lot of other Gundam anime series. And that's because the series is built upon the foundation of great characterization, but it's also backed up by good production value and kick-ass action scenes. Great episode right here, guys. Another great one for the series. A little slow in the second half of the episode, but for the most part, a solid addition. I'm going to give this one right here a 4 out of 5. Check it out, Iron-Blooded Orphans fans. If any of you guys did watch the episode, make sure to tell me what you thought about it. 
in the comments section below. What did you think of the awesome mobile suit battles at the beginning of the episode? What is going to be the twist with McGillis Fareed losing his power? How do you think the series is going to end? Will it end in tragedy where it'll actually have a happy ending? What do you hope to see? Please tell me in the comment section below and make sure to subscribe to the channel for all things Gundam and anime related. Please leave me a comment or two. I would love to chat with you guys. And of course, if you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up and share it with all your friends. I will see you guys next time. And as always, stay dandy, baby.